Item two, declarations of conflicts of interest. None. None. Item four, approval of minutes. Uh, Miss three, approval of agenda. Oh, sorry. Approval of agenda. Chair, I just want to uh, bring up something just about uh, uh, Janice Harper's presentation to the uh, Mayor's Task Force and Active Transportation. Okay, we'll put that under G. Okay, thank you. Rule of agenda. I'll move. Oh, do I have a seconder? No, no, I need a mover and I need a seconder. Moved by McCabe, seconded by Brown. Here. Okay, so let's try it again. Do I have a mover? Can you hear? Councilman McCabe? Yeah, I moved it. Okay. And I second. Okay. Motion carried. Approval of minutes. Moved. I'll second. Philip Brown. Okay. Business arising from the minutes? None. None? No. Okay. We'll move on to reports. Before we do, I want to welcome uh, Donna Waddell to uh, the Environment Sustainability. Uh, I think this is your first committee meeting, Donna. Welcome. It I is, and, what, to, uh, and how great it is that you're the chair, Mr. Chair. <laughs> well, I don't know whether to offer you my condolences or my congratulations. <laughs> Nonetheless, welcome, Donna. <laughs> Thanks a million, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Donna, we're just going to be informal here. I'm going to call you Donna. You call me Mitchell. Uh, Food Council recommendation, backyard composting. Katrina, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm presenting this report on behalf of the Food Council. Uh, the report was put together by two of our wonderful Food Council members, Sean Martin and Brad Duran. Um, so they have the collectively, the Food Council has been working on a municipal food policy review. And one of the items they were looking at was backyard composting regulations. Um, so you'll see attached the city's nuisance bylaw and a portion of the um, PEI's Environmental Protection Act resource management regulations. So what they found in their review was that in our nuisance bylaw under section 3.12B, I believe it is, yeah, um, they did identify a barrier to backyard composting. So the clause that is there indicates that all waste, compost, and recyclable materials must be put in um, designated containers approved by IWMC and collected by IWMC. So in that regulation, it doesn't stipulate that people cannot backyard compost, but it's a bit of a gray area where it doesn't clarify that they can, and if anything, sort of indicates that they're not allowed to. However, the Food Council has identified backyard composting as a priority um, because it is important in reducing food waste and promoting local food production. So they did some research as to what those regulations could be changed to be. Um, so in the EPA that the province has, um, they do indicate that backyard composting is exempt from any other of the regulations identified within the EPA. And they also include a fairly robust definition of backyard composting, um, which you'll be able to see in the report. Um, so because of that, um, they're recommending that the Charlotte City of Charlottetown Nuisance Bylaw is amended to reflect the language in the EPA and make sure that we're protecting people's ability to compost in their backyard. So they're requesting that um, a subset section be added under 3.12 in the nuisance bylaw that indicates that 3.12b, which is where right now it's indicating everything has to go through IWMC, that it does not apply to backyard composting. 
They're also indicating um, that we add a section under that that stipulates the requirements for backyard composting. So we did consult a couple of different times with the city's bylaw enforcement officer, and this was his recommendation to add um, just to enable the city to have some enforcement ability if people aren't backyard composting correctly and if there's vermin problems or smell problems um, or or the composting's kind of happening too close to a property boundary. Um, so you'll see those recommendations there. They would like the containers to be a minimum of five meters from adjacent dwellings. Um, they mustn't create offensive odors and they must not attract pests. Um, and then they also request that a definition um, for backyard composting be added to the bylaw. Um, and they would also like to note that if there were to be issues arising, there would, because of those stipulations, there would be um, enforcement abilities as well as through the city's um, dangerous, hazardous, and unsightly premises bylaw. Um, and yeah, I'll just mention again that we do have the support of the bylaw enforcement officer on this proposal. Uh, so with that, the recommendation would be for this committee to approve those recommendations and forward them on to emergency and protective services who oversee the nuisance bylaw. Thank you, Katrina. Is there any questions? Are there any uh, recommendations or any uh, discussions surrounding the, the recommendations from uh, from Katrina? Uh, good synopsis. And, you know, you, you have been in discussions with the bylaw enforcement officers, so that's good. Uh, so by the time it gets to the uh, Tactical and Emergencies Committee, uh, they should pretty well be informed as to uh, the discussions that's taking place here, plus discussions that are taking place with staff. I think that's safe to say, right, Katrina? I hope so. I mean, that's assuming that they're getting updated on on their end, and I, I hope that to be the case. Uh, just want to ask you a question. Um, Certainly. The recommendations come, come forward from the Food Council, and, and, you know, you expressed that uh, there were parameters around the uh, backyard composting. Have you uh, had the opportunity to look at other jurisdictions to see uh, what they do when it comes to backyard composting? The last thing we want is, uh, you know, uh, although it's good intentions, where it's it is an inconvenience and a nuisance for uh, adjacent property owners, then all of a sudden the phone starts ringing, our bylaw enforcement officers out there trying to. Uh, you know, trying to explain or trying to say, well, you're not really uh, following the uh, the nuisance bylaw in terms of, you know, square footage and all those other things. Have, have you had the opportunity to look at other jurisdictions? And and if you did, what, uh, what did you notice? Yeah, so I haven't personally um, been the one doing the research on that. It was the food council members, but I do know that they did take a look at that, um, especially after we had our first meeting with the bylaw enforcement officer. Um, so that is where the recommendations for the requirements for the backyard um, composting are coming from um, that they're recommending to be included. So some municipalities are indicating things like distance from property boundaries and that kind of thing. Um, so that research was done. The other thing that a lot of municipalities are doing, they are doing things like this to protect people's right to backyard compost, but they're also doing a lot of education around it, which is something we would intend to do. So there's some great resources out there um, that we could put on the website and promote through social media. And if any issues came up there, again, we could send them um, that really show people how to properly backyard compost and to mitigate some of those issues. So there really shouldn't be um, pest issues or smell issues if the proper things are going into that compost um, and, an, and an appropriate container is being used. So um, those sort of seem to be the things that other municipalities are doing to prevent any issues from arising. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. I mean, we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, uh, compliance. Mm -hmm. compliance Absolutely. That at the ones that are, uh, you know, having the backyard compost, especially in the older parts of the city where properties are right on top of one another, you know, I mean, you're right in close quarters. So uh, I just, just want you to be cognizant of that fact, Katrina, yeah, and, and hopefully send that message back to the Food Council. And, yeah. and for Todd, our bylaw enforcement officer, is very well aware of that because he's, he's the one that's out there in the trenches. He's the one that's Certainly. got to go out there and communications and 
enforcement and you know the onus is on on him to make sure there is compliance so please keep that in mind any yep, questions certainly thank you mr Karina. chair mr chair yeah. Karina. yeah go ahead i i know in uh, jurisdictions where they have composting and you have food waste that will create odors and severe odors i still don't know how you address that i think that they do apply soil over top of the food waste to allow it to to uh, decompose so my question is will there be is there is there a procedure in that we'll put out for anyone wishing to set up a, uh, a composter in their backyard a procedure on how to uh, maintain it and uh, yep. and uh, ensure that it doesn't uh, present or, or i more or less provide um, pre present or make more problems for the neighborhood yeah that's my so first question Yes, certainly. Um, so the plan would be to do that education, as you're mentioning, really make sure people know what they're doing with the backyard composting. Um, like there are certain food items that aren't appropriate for a home composting system. Um, so, you know, the recommendation would be for those people to continue to put those items in the IWMC bin and take those out um, biweekly. But um, there are a lot of things that can go in those home composting systems and it would yeah. theoretically reduce some of the burden on IWMC. Um, and also allow people to be a bit more self-sufficient with their gardening. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, that's why it would be a, a very good idea, Katrina, that if we could have a public information meeting on uh, on the whole concept mm -hmm. and how it, it, it will benefit uh, not just our immediate community, but it's all part of the global community's effort to reduce our carbon footprint. So. That's something we could look at, Mr. Chair, is a public information session that would uh, uh, provide uh, a, an introduction to uh, compost in, in anyone's backyard. And I don't know how it would affect uh, apartment dwellers because that creates a whole other level of, uh, of decomp uh, de uh, com uh, composting, but also who takes care of it. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, again, Katrina, I would suggest, or Mr. Chair, that we would look at a uh, public information session as we go through this process. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ramona, could you take that under advisement? Um, I, I like the way that you, uh, you know, set up the public information sessions as, as opposed to a traditional conventional public meeting. Uh, I think, you know, we, we could host one here at City Hall or uh, pretty Three uh, at quarters. Maybe we could we could take a site or another venue. I'll leave that to you, Ramona. Why don't you look at some possibilities and and set it up the uh, the format that you uh, have in, have put in uh, put in you know activated over the last two to three years, and maybe we can come up with something along those lines. Certainly. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we'll work with staff and and come up with some options on that. Sure, that'd be great. Any other questions for Katrina? No other questions. Thank you, Katrina. That's a very well, uh, very well written report. And uh, kudos to the Food Council. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we recognize their uh, their efforts and their diligence in bringing this recommendation forward. Item B: Food Recovery Network Update. And I guess that's back to you again, Katrina. Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so this one is just an update on a project that we would have informed you about a couple of months ago. Um, we received funding for it in November of 2021 uh, through the province's Climate Challenge Fund. So um, we called it the PEI Food Recovery Network, and it is in partnership with Farm and Food Care PEI. Um, and we officially launched it in January. So we just thought it was a good time to bring you an update on how things are going. So just as a reminder, the project was intended to divert surplus food from going to waste by um, basically matching up um, 
retailers and producers and wholesalers that have surplus food with nonprofits that can put it to use. So the project had three components. The first was a study to assess the current scope of food waste in Charlottetown. Um, the second was a dedicated marketing and education campaign with the intent to recruit those businesses and nonprofits to an app called the Second Harvest Food Rescue app, which is kind of like that matching service. And then the third part was a small scale infrastructure fund that will fund infrastructure purchases for nonprofits that will allow them to better disseminate that surplus food. So whether it be a fridge or a freezer or canning equipment. Um, so Second Harvest, which is Canada's largest food rescue charity was contracted to carry out the project. And they are based in the GTA, but um, they have a representative in Fredericton who's leading the project and they've also hired an on the ground in PEI coordinator. So, as I said, it was officially launched in January. Um, and the first thing that they did was launch the food waste assessment survey. So they sent that around to businesses and ended up getting 27 responses and had some pretty interesting findings. Um, the first of which was that all of the respondents had donatable surplus food, either consistently or periodically. Um, they also found that the most common surplus food items were um, prepared foods, produce and meat or fish, which are in very high demand amongst nonprofit organizations. They also found that over 80% of respondents were not currently donating the surplus food that their businesses experience. Um, and they found that the most frequent reason for that was because of concerns over legal liability issues, uh, which actually aren't um, that much of a concern. There are great protections out there. Um, so it was really interesting to see all of that because it showed the untapped potential of that surplus food and also great ways to educate the community as to how um, more of that food can be donated and remove some of those barriers. So um, they used that information to set some concrete goals for the project. So you can see those in the table on the report. So the project runs basically from January of 2022 to the end of January 2023. And their goals for the project are to divert, um, I, I don't necessarily need to go through all of them, but um, over 350,000 meals from going to waste. Um, and that corresponds with over 1.3 million pounds of carbon dioxide equivalents. So um, that's a pretty great goal, I think. As of March 2022, which was the last time that they did a, um, an interim report for us, they had rescued approximately 100,000 meals already, which is great, um, and a little over 500,000 pounds of CO2 equivalent. Um, and they also had three new app users, so, but they think that that's a bit slow to get going. They've been doing a lot of information sessions. They recently did a really successful one with nonprofits. It was very well attended. They've been attending various board, um, board meetings and sending out targeted newsletters to a lot of groups, such as the Hotel Association and the PEI Chefs Association. So um, as they work with those groups, they're confident that um, they'll be getting more people on the app. And they're also seeing success with current app users that maybe were on there but not using it, beginning to actually um, either put on donations or receive donations. And then the last piece being the small scale infrastructure fund. So that um, the management of that has stayed with city staff and farm and food care staff. There's $15,000 total available through that fund and nonprofits are eligible up, um, for up to $5,000 each towards the purchase of that infrastructure. Um, and just so all of you know, applications are being accepted until the end of this month um, and then we'll assess and award the funds. Um, and just for reference, the total budget for the project was $53,000, um, 47,700 of which came from the Climate Challenge Fund. Uh, the city contributed 2,300 in cash um, and we're also contributing $1,000 in kind, and the remaining is in kind from Farm and Food Care. Thank you, Katrina, for that excellent report. Excellent report. Uh, there's a lot in here to digest. Um, so excellent, uh, excellent report. Uh, just demonstrates, uh, you know, again, the good work that this, this particular department has been doing over the last few years. It's truly creative and innovative. It's thought provoking and it gives our residents uh, just a small indication of just how creative uh, our, our, our department is and the good work that our staff is doing. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Uh, I'll open up the floor to other members of the committee. Mr. Chair. 
just Katrina, on, on the practical side, are we doing any uh, food recovery networking with our farmers market out in Belvedere Avenue, or is that uh, something that uh, maybe the community fridge is looking at? Are we doing mm -hmm. that? I know that they have a fridge there that some of their vendors are putting uh, food in every week that does go directly to the community fridge. Um, right. I'm sure that some of the vendors are on second, second harvest list in terms of who they're engaging with. I don't know that any of them are on on the app like as an individual, um, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that second harvest is is working with the farmer's market and with the community fridge at some yeah. level. Yeah, I was speaking to uh, Sheena and uh the family there a couple of Sundays ago and uh, the community fridge is going very well um, but it's the issue of, of fruits and vegetables because they're perishables mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's difficult so if there's a way that we can replenish that uh, um, incentive uh, initiative with you know not fresh fresh food is as as best as can, as best it, as best it can be that'll be a great help but that's that's good good to know Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Any other questions from the members of the committee? No? Okay. Uh, once again, uh, Katrina, excellent work. But that's usually par for the course. You, you do great work and uh, it's fantastic. And I look forward to, uh, you know, the next stage and bringing this yeah. forward and engaging, engaging uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so our next uh, item is urban forestry report card. Jessica, you're on. You're on tap. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So our department recently worked with consultants that specialize in urban forestry, and so with them we did a deep dive into our urban forestry operations. So we are a small but mighty team, and there are a lot of demands. So we wanted to look at what we're doing well and areas of improvement and then kind of benchmark and look at best management practices and standards in the industry and look at how we rank compared to those standards and compared to other municipalities. So uh, members of the committee would have received a lengthy report of about 100 pages. So that dives into about 165 questions that we worked on with the consultants. And out of the 165 areas, we ranked good in 31, we ranked fair in 70, and opportunity for improvement, which is kind of the lowest score, we ranked in 64 areas. So I won't go into kind of like all the rankings, but a few I will kind of point out just to give you a, a sense of the report. So our areas of strength include our street and park tree inventory, which is an amazing tool that we have and use on a daily basis. Uh, we have a tree canopy cover assessment. We have our public tree protection and bylaw now. We're doing tree plantings um, around food growing and uh, fruit and nut tree plantings. We seek a lot of external funding for urban forest management. We do a lot of uh, tree inspections. And some of the areas of improvement are uh, around resources. So one being our lack of any year round tree management staff, um, urban forestry direction in our official plan, which I understand will be updated soon. So hopefully we'll see some updates in that. Um, around private tree plantings, private tree data, um, requirements for plantings to happen as part of residential development is an improvement setting targets. So what would we like our tree canopy cover to be? How many street trees would we like on each street? Those kinds of things. Uh, backlog of tree pruning needs. Uh, one around our wood waste. So coming up with like a higher end use for that wood waste. Right now it goes to landfill, which is not ideal. Uh, looking into a tree risk management policy and then doing more around communications and public engagement. So that's just a snapshot. I hope you'll take time. Um, my goal with providing this committee with this report is to provide you with lots of information and more tools in your tool belt to make really great decisions as a council and as a committee around urban forestry management. And uh, I hope you'll take time to read the report and happy to answer any questions. 
I'll start it off. Thank you. Do you have a copy of the report card? Yes, so Cindy would have had it digitally, so I think she emailed it out with the package, but I can definitely, if you want, it's 100 pages, so I didn't want to print it out for everyone. No. Okay. Well, so I'll come back to this again. I brought it up before. It's great that we have, you know, uh, all these different uh, recommendations and additions and deletions and strengths and weaknesses, but Somewhere along the line, I think we need to get back to replanting trees in our neighborhoods. And I, I brought up Upper Prince Street and, and the Waltham Drives. So if we go back 40, 50, 60 years ago, these particular streets had beautiful trees. And I, I'd like to try to try to recapture that type of an ambiance, that type of aesthetics, and, and work with the with the community and replanting these trees on our on our city streets. I mean, some of our neighborhoods are bare now. They don't have trees, not like what it was decades ago. And it's great that we all have this, but I would like to see, to my mind, a very enthusiastic, aggressive tree planting program in some of our neighborhoods that at one time had beautiful trees. Now, uh, I know some of those trees had to come down because of the Dutch Elm disease. Don Waddell would have the corporate history on that. But uh, that's something that's near and dear to my heart and, and near and dear to a lot of residents, particularly in the older parts of the city. So uh, I'm just going to reiterate that one more time, Jessica. I, I thank you for your report, but I'd like to embark upon a, a new program uh, where we're working with the residents, planting new trees, and try to recapture what, which once existed a number of decades ago. Yes, I think our department would wholeheartedly agree with you, and that's what we work to do every day. Yeah. The challenges with some of these neighborhoods in Charlottetown is there's so much, like some of these streets, you know, you have road, sidewalk, and house, housing frontage is really close to that. So as we've developed, there's some streets where there's not a lot of space for new trees. So in those cases, I would love to see us get involved in some kind of backyard tree planning program where there's the space to do that. Because at the end of the day, there will be streets where it will be difficult for us to add new trees when they come out, unless we invest in in soil cell technology, which we're testing out as well. But I totally agree. And that's what we're doing all the time is trying to add tree cover. And the other side of that is is around tree protection. So planting yeah. is one thing, protecting what we have is, the second equally important piece of that puzzle. Yeah. Well, even thank you, thank you, um, Jessica. Even if we use those particular streets or or that neighborhood as a case study, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd really like to pursue it. To be very yeah. honest with you, and I really like to pursue that um, and and communicate with the residents to get their thoughts and their ideas. I mean, it's their neighborhoods; they they have some. Uh, I'm sure they'd have some great ideas that they'd like to share with, uh, you know, with our uh, staff here at City Hall and elected officials. Uh, some of these people have lived in these neighborhoods for 60, 70 years. And in fact, number of Prince Street even longer. You know, we have residents live in that street for a long, long time. And I mean, just the history and the knowledge they can bring forward would be a tremendous asset. So uh, please take that under consideration. And uh, like I said, Donna would be able to, uh, you know, uh, you got the corporate memory of it as we dealt with the Dutch Allen disease. And and uh, I think the idea was when we took those trees down, Donna, was we would do a replacement. A replacement. Yes. I think it was two trees for every one that come down. And please correct me if I'm wrong. But every one that come down, we were supposed to replace it with two. Donna, can you jump in, please? Sure, Mr. Chair. Um. Yes, I, I chased those Dutch elm trees all over Charlottetown <laughs> with 15 feet of snow, if you will recall. <laughs> yeah. um, and indeed, you were right, but they weren't guaranteed to be full grown trees or larger trees and not necessarily in the spot. Now, this is corporate memory. I haven't looked at this, uh, Mitchell, in probably six or seven years. Um, but at times, you couldn't place the trees where they where we took them down 
Um, so for example, on my street, a lot of the trees went down there, uh, but there, there just was no room to, to put new trees up on that street because you have, to, you have to plan for 20 years, 30 years down the road that these trees are gonna be full grown trees and have all these roots going in the ground. So um, uh, I, I was just kind of, as you were talking there, Jessica, I was kind of drifting through with the budget there, um, trying to find your tree planting budget. I don't know where it is, but I'll find it eventually. Um, I, I'm sure that you have money in your budget for, for new tree planting, do you not? Yes, so our department being a bit of an umbrella to support other departments. So I have funds that come through Parks and Rec for tree work in parks, and then the street work is through public works. Okay, I, I was kind of, and then I we also figured have as much. Sustainability budget. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't think Mr. I can Chair? add anything else. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. So Jessica and uh, Jessica and Philip Brown were out at uh, Irwin Drive to this morning for the business tree planting uh, campaign. Um, there were businesses from all over the city participating in what, planting what, 300 trees, Jessica? 330. And, 330. Uh, then last, and then last week, there was Arbor Day out at Victoria Park where four schools participated in, uh, in a tree planting, environmental awareness, wildlife awareness, all good uh, good information. And then last fall, Upton Farm uh, had a tree planting uh, get together where they planted over 150 trees. So a lot of this is going on, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think it's it's not just one department, it's it's multifaceted. Uh, it's a multifaceted effort that uh, provides this, uh, this uh, tree planting exercise so that we can continue to replant trees because they're so important to the environment. And I, I, again, this morning was a great uh, example of, I'd say 50 to 60 business people were out helping with the tree planting, just showing the importance of trees in our, in our community. And it can be in a downtown setting or it can be in a subdivision like uh, uh, Irwin Drive, Katy Drive and so forth. So kudos to the department. And you have to see the, the trailer they purchased to ensure that they have the right equipment to, uh, uh, provide any of the volunteers that come out to help out with this effort. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. great. No, um, you know, and I think that's fantastic. You know, those, these are all great initiatives. Uh, I'd like to get into the older neighborhoods, the older neighborhoods where we had beautiful trees in our city, and some of them had to come down because of the Dutch Elm disease and. I just like to uh, like to embark upon a new program to uh, maybe we can title it uh, uh, neighborhood tree planting. Certainly, again, I bring it back to the older, the historic part of the cities. I, I talked about the Waltham Drives, uh, Upper Prince Street. See, the, I mean, the trees. I saw pictures of the trees on, on Waltham Drive, and it was just it was incredible. And you know, maybe someday we can recapture that. It may, maybe it takes you know twenty or thirty or forty years, but uh, I'd really like to take a serious look at that. I really would. So uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, excellent report. I know uh, I know you've done a lot of work here. Uh, the report card, like you say, is a hundred pages, and uh, you know you've brought it down to what so that we could look at it here. And, and look at the strengths and the weaknesses, and it's good inventory. And I'm sure we're going to be discussing this at uh, future meetings. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, item D, the popular switch program update. Ramona, please. Great. Um, so I'll just share my screen if that's okay. I think I can do that. Everybody see that now? Great. 
So just because we've got some visuals in here, I did want to, to be able to point out some of these um, items in there. So again, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, very popular program. We're getting a lot of calls and a lot of people that are moving through the program, which is excellent. So since our update, the end of January, we've seen 54% um, increase in the number of completed projects. We've seen um, a 42% increase in the number of signed participant agreements. So participant agreements, essentially, it means they've got their home energy assessment complete. They've got all their quotes from their, con they've picked their contractor and they've got their quote solidified for their project and they're signing that agreement that they want to move ahead with that um, through the SWITCH program. And then um, a slight decrease in the number of folks that are just at that thinking um, planning stage, but as you can see, a lot of folks are moving from that thinking planning stage into um, other parts of the project. Then also wanted to note just in terms of the overall value of the signed participant agreements um, by the end of April, we were up to 2.2 million in activity, which is wonderful to see. That's an excellent like economic development story for our community as well. That's a lot of work that's happening in those sectors um, that maybe wouldn't be without the, the ability of the switch program to help with the upfront costs of financing. And then, um, so the value of completed projects, so lots of work happening right now to move those from the, the signed participant agreement phase to completion. And the average project size for our community is about 16,000. And then finally, just kind of looking at a, a breakdown of what people are, are picking to do, heat pumps continues to be our most popular um, initiative that folks are moving ahead with. And then solar and building envelope as our second two with, with other miscellaneous um, upgrades at 7%. And but 56% of that cost is actually on the solar because those are more expensive projects. So lots of new solar going up in Charlottetown, lots of people getting heat pumps, lots of people making upgrades to their building envelope, all the things that we wanted to see through this program. Um, so, and as you know, we have funding through FCM for this project. FCM provides all the zero interest um, financing for it, as well as a grant for us to be able to run this program and work with our partners at Pace Atlantic. We are doing some marketing to help grow the program, but again, a lot of that, it's kind of taking off so much that we haven't been marketing it as much because we do want to make sure that we can kind of sustain things and, and keep people moving through the program quickly, which is was a challenge, especially in the first few months. Um, and just one thing to note, we have worked with the uh, PEI Public Library, so there is um, in uh, there is um, 10 energy meters and seven infrared camera devices that have been um, provided to the libraries that they can sign out on a library um, with their library card and definitely encourage your residents to go in and get these. The infrared cameras are very easy to use. Essentially, they're just like a heat sensing camera. So you can, you know, be standing in a room and you're wondering, you know, where are those drafts? Where are those places where air leakage is getting in? It's going to clearly show you that very easy to use. And um, it's a great way for people that if, they, you know, they want to do something inexpensive, just get some caulking and, and that camera and that can really go them in terms of being able to reduce some of their heating loss. So, so that's kind of a quick overview. I know we've got a, a full agenda, but um, if there's any questions, I can certainly answer. Uh, I, I, thank you, Ramona. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of good information here and we've had some uh, meetings in conjunction with, you know, Stratford, for example, uh, you know, talking about the switch program, you might want to consider maybe having uh, another open house here in the city of Charlottetown. Uh, it's a popular program. People are really engaged with this program. And um, I'd like to like it to become a hallmark here at City Hall. And uh, just want to bring that to your attention. Maybe Maybe we get more information and more dialogue going with their residents to take advantage of this program. And you might want to consider uh, some type of an open house. It's a, look, it's a great news story, something that we should be promoting and, and celebrating, which we are. Uh, but please keep that in mind that maybe we we could hold uh, or host some type of an open house some evening, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. 
Uh, the more information we get out to the residents, uh, the better, and maybe the more involved they'll become with this program. Thank you, Ramona. Any questions for Ramona? No? Thanks again, Ramona. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next uh, item is the micro grant recipient approval program. And um, Jessica, I think you're going to you're going to lead us uh, yep. lead us with yep. uh, that report. Uh, I noticed the uh, the committee. That's a pretty large committee. Uh, can you tell me how the committee members were selected? Yeah, sure. So um, we do an internal selection committee and we try to get representation from a lot of the different departments within the city as an opportunity for them to kind of review the applications um, and flag any potential feasibility issues that might come up uh, before, like with actually carrying out the project that, that the application outlines before we actually award and, and proceed with that. So that's that's kind of how we, we try to just get good representation from different uh, departments within the city and then in addition to that this year we invited Bernie Plord who is the chair of the food council to kind of provide some representation and, and input on food related projects and Mark Sandiford who works with creative PEI and he's also on the arts advisory board for the city of Charlottetown so that he could weigh in on any of the art related projects that came through okay Thank you. Uh, any questions for Ramona? No oh, questions. Um, yeah, Did so you I'll want just to oh. go ahead. Uh, did you want me to go through the rest of the report now? Please. Um, yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, so the my community sustainability micro grant program um, offers uh, micro grants up to twenty five hundred dollars to uh, community members or groups that want to do a project in the city that helps uh, us achieve our sustainability goals. Uh, the deadline for this year's program was April twenty seventh. And we received 15 applications in total and 12 of those were eligible and were reviewed by the selection committee last week. Um, I have a list in the report of the projects that were selected and, and the amounts that were uh, awarded to each of them. Um, and we were lucky enough to have the water. So we, the sustainability department has $15,000 to put towards these micro grants. And we're lucky enough to have water and sewer contribute $5,000 for water or water conservation related projects that come through. And in addition, um, Parks and Rec has access to some Go PEI participants participation funding so they were able to contribute up to fifteen hundred dollars for um, like active healthy living parks and recreation uh, related projects so we were able to we had access to twenty one thousand dollars in total and we did um, award all of that to the different projects and we were able to fund 10 projects this year hey that looks like a looks like a pretty diverse group uh, Very, very interesting. Very interesting and uh, good, good cross section. Yeah, can I just make a comment? Can I just make Sorry. a comment? Can I just make a comment? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I just want to say, guys, it's really nice to see the criteria laid out so it's really clear for people to know what their uh, what the requirements are for these monies that we are giving. Um, it'd be great to share some of these kind of templates across the across the whole department it's it's just really clear when people know exactly what the criteria is when we are giving money so i want to say great job thank you yeah that's Thanks, a good, good suggestion ramona is that do, are, are, are uh, participants or potential participants aware of the criteria yeah it's all it's all shared on the application process so when they're applying they can see clearly what the criteria is like if we have any focus themes for that year that's all all clear to them yeah thank you chair? go ahead mr chair um mr chair you may recall in the past i know that uh, i know because of 
COVID-19, we had to stop a lot of our uh, participatory gatherings. But in the past, Mr. Chair, there were opportunities for the community to actively listen to the presentations of these micro grant applications at the Murphy Center. And Ramon, I think that took place over a couple of years. Why, why did that uh, go to the wayside? Was that because of just uh, the, the, the logistics of organizing that event? Because it was a great event for people to listen to the presentations and to get an understanding of what would be going out into our community. I know working with the criteria that you have now, or the criterion that you're using to evaluate these projects is is easier with it with a committee. But where did where did the, the the whole idea of presenting these projects and it was a very community enlightenment of what was going on in the community or what would be going on in the community through these different projects. Yeah, so we did um, the pitch party one year. Um, otherwise, we always did a selection committee. It was just that one year that we did an open format like that. Yeah. Um, so each um, person that was interested in funding had to get up and present their pitch. We did it yeah. sort of in a quick style like that, and then community members could vote. Yeah. We did get, uh, I'll be honest, we did get some really negative feedback on that approach because there was a feeling that people were having to compete and it was like a popularity contest. We felt the same as you in that it gave great exposure to the project and it was a nice way to kind of create a sort of fun community building night. Um, I guess the other challenge that we've noticed over time, and this is why we've changed uh, the format of the selection committee to have more internal folks participate, is that we were approving um, projects in isolation of the other departments, and then they were running into snags when they went into implementation. So, you know, this is something that you wanted to do in a city park, but parks weren't wasn't involved in the discussion, and they could tell you that this doesn't meet the rules of that park. So what we find is that we went review internally, we're getting all those things discussed um, at the forefront before we move forward with the project. And if there's something that the proponent needs to know about, we can inform them um, as part of their uh, approval. Um, but and it's also, you know, it is a good staff engagement opportunity as well yes. for yeah. to get that group of folks together and have them go through these projects and and feel really excited about some of the things that are happening in the community. So, you know, it, I think it would be, we're always looking at ways of how we profile these projects, which was the nice yeah. thing about the pitch party. Um, how do we yeah. make sure that people are aware of the great things that are happening? But um, that was the challenge which, with, with that approach. Yeah. And, and, and I attended that uh, get together and there was a lot of energy, positive energy. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that there was that, uh, the, the other side, uh, the con side to it, but uh, a lot of people knew about these projects and how they were going, what what effect they will have on what effect they were going to have in the community. So I thought it was a very positive experience. But yeah, in terms of working through these through these silos, getting out of these silos, like I as you mentioned, water and wastewater. The utility provides five thousand dollars in funding, and I guess other funding comes from other departments. So that's a great way of collaborating amongst the different departments. Anyways, thank you for the response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ramona. Uh, you were ac accurate with, uh, you know, different departments or committees not knowing what was taking place and projects were being announced, and, and the respective committees and, and and their departments and their responsibilities uh, weren't being advised, and then you were trying to play catch up, and then in some cases you couldn't approve the project. There was no consultation. There was no collaboration. So I, I, I like the uh, I like. The format now is has improved and enhanced so that all departments are involved. And I think if you go back and look at the, uh, the makeup of that committee, as you pointed out earlier, there is good representation. There's a good cross section. And, you know, it's, it's great to have, you know, a night where everyone's there. But I, 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 some people don't like it, getting up and giving presentations. They, it's, it's, it's challenging for some folks. And, you know, they want to, they want to bring their project forward. They want to do it uh, to the best of their ability. And I can understand not wanting to get up and compete with another project. Uh, yeah, there's, there's got to be, there's got to be a better way. I mean, it's nice to have a, a community meeting, but you don't want to have uh, 
people up there or different groups, entities up there trying to compete with one another. Now they're saying, this is why our project is so much better than the next project. And I know that's not the case. But sometimes that's a perception. That's the reality of it. And uh, the easier we can make it, the better. But uh, I think, I think, Ramona, the format has improved. I think the format, the, 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 uh, the grading system, the representation on your committee has improved so that no standing committee should be caught off guard or no department should be caught off guard, as was the case, even though it wasn't intentional. That did happen in, in years gone by. That did happen. Yeah. So thank you, Ramona. Mr. Chair, just just in reference of, the, of that uh, pitch uh, gathering that was at the Murphy Community Center, yeah. my point was to uh, to share the uh, the information that was given to the uh, public during the presentations. Yes, it might have come across a, as competitive, which it was in the end. But in everyone that was at, at that uh, pitch party, were well aware of what was going to be happening in the community. So. If there's a way that we can get that information out, uh, I don't know if it's a community celebration at the end of the, the projects or at the beginning, it's just people when they know a, a, about what, what's happening or what will be happening in their community and in a positive way, I think it's good for all of us. It's, it's for the greater good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, just, I just, I want more more folks to come forward and be able to submit their, uh, you know, their applications and their ideas and their initiatives. I want them to pursue that where they they think they can do it and, and not have to go up against, you know, some of these, uh, some of these participants, are, you know, they're very, uh, very well organized. Uh, they get excellent presentations and, and, you know, in some cases it can be intimidating. It can be intimidating, but there's gotta be a way to get up and share these uh, good news stories. And I'm sure that Ramona is taking our comments here, uh, written them down, and, and looking forward to uh, you know uh, maybe maybe it's the conclusion of, of the program and and talking about uh, you know the good new uh, some of the good initiatives that are being pursued, how the city's involved, and and maybe we can incur encourage more participants next year, uh, and bringing up that criteria that uh, that Julie's talked about and. And, and creating more incentives. So uh, no, it's 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 great, and I think the program's come a long way, Ramon. I really do. So thank you for that. Um, okay, our next item is bike week uh, update, and I think <coughs> that's Jessica. Yeah, it, I think we just we need a motion to approve the uh, selections of the of the micro grants there. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, Ramon. Moved. Round moved. Motion carried. Nola? You're okay. All right. So our item F, bike week update. Great. So that's that's me again. Um so bike week uh, this year, bike week is something that the city does every year as an opportunity to encourage cycling, highlight the benefits of cycling, educate on safety and, and awareness of cycling and, and really just to celebrate it. Um, it's definitely something that that's growing in popularity and, and we're seeing it, it, it be a hot topic of conversation and news and, and bike week is just a very positive um, celebration and safety oriented week. So this year it's going to be held uh, from June 13th to June 19th um, in the city of Charlottetown. Uh, we're doing a lot of kind of similar things that we do every single year with this, um, but but we're going to have a couple different events this year. So uh, we've got a group, some group mountain bike rides, bike to work and school day. Um, we're going to have our cycling heritage exhibit in Victoria Park again this year. We're going to do our, um, we're going to post our bike week mural on the Confederation Trail, do some radio ads, some prize giveaways, social media campaign, and um, all of that kind of stuff. And then this year we're doing a new event, a new big cycling event. Now that we're back to being able to gather um, in larger numbers, we're going to have a bike friendly block party. And this is a partnership with bike friendly Charlottetown and the city of Charlottetown. It's going to be hosted in Victoria Park um, on, on the Saturday of bike week, the June 18th. There's going to be um, lots of different activities, uh, barbecue and it's going to culminate with a mayor's ride and a bike parade at the end of the event and will be a great opportunity to bring people together and to celebrate cycling. 
So that's that's what we have planned for this year. Thank you, Jessica. Any any questions? Yeah, I challenge the uh, council to do that bike uh, bike race uh, and uh, do it around Victoria Park. Any takers? No takers. <laughs> what? Anyway, it's, it's Jessica, it's a Mr. great Mr. time. Mr. 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 Uh, Mr. Mayor, just around What's that the park. Yeah. Oh, just yeah. Just down Brighton along the uh, Victoria Park Lane, and uh, the winner will get a toomey. Well, hopefully, we'll keep that lane in Victoria Park. <laughs> Um, I'll challenge you, Your Worship. I'll I'll bike against you. Okay, <laughs> let's go. You're you're on, Ramona. You're on. <laughs> what about the Jessicas? Are they going to get into it? And Katrina, I'll take you. I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, I, you know, when we look at working with other other departments, it's it's unfortunate. I'm not trying to be critical, but I think it's unfortunate we don't have any bike lanes in the new infrastructure that's going to be constructed at the uh, SO. At the SO intersection, I mean, this, this project's been in the works for a long time. Uh, bike friendly. There's been more emphasis on on uh, active transportation pathways in our city, and I just don't know how this fell through fell through the gaps and and why this wasn't a priority. It should have been a priority. It's it's nothing new. I mean, there's tremendous amount of emphasis and and. Uh, Demand. I would even go so far as to say a demand from uh, from you know members of our community, the cycling community, the, the walking community, uh, jogging community, uh, persons of disabilities, and their own you know their own uh, motorized uh, wheelchairs. I mean, I, I don't know why that didn't happen. Uh, it should have happened. It's not trying to be critical, and I know there's a lot of disappointment in the community. So uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is time to correct that. I mean, there's double turn in with them yet. So maybe there is time to correct that. Mr. I think Chair, Donnie, speak. Just, just hold it, Don. I think you want to speak. Mr. Chair, um, just as a follow up to that, there was some confusion earlier in the week on that matter, um, and I, I spoke to a number of people on it, um, including the chair of Public Works. Um, and it was it was miscommunication on on the st between between us, and it was very sad that that happened because it lifted expectations, and then and then of course they weren't dealt with. Right now, given given what I am given to understand is that it's a safety issue in the amount of land that we have. If we, I, I think maybe there are some designs that if we had, if we were building a roundabout, the roundabout out on the 48 road could probably accommodate uh, uh, a bike lane. But given the constraints of the land that we have in at the belt at the SL, it was it was never able to be considered. It would be lovely if we could, but in most urban areas, you don't see bike lanes unless they're in new areas, newer areas with w w wider streets. So uh, I, I I did spend quite a bit of time on that over this this week. And um, uh, unfortunately, that they, they were not, they had looked at it, but they were not able to do it because of safety reasons. Now, what what is there is that the, the crosswalks are what they call pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, I'm not sure what the difference between one crosswalk and, and that crosswalk is, but but um, uh, that that is what I'm advised. Thank you, Donna. Um, I, I, it, Public Works would have known earlier that there was a challenge in terms of land acquisition. Um, was there was a discussion as to say, okay, if we're going to go with uh, constructing uh, these bike lanes, uh, was that discussed? I mean, how much more land did we need uh, to be able to to uh, have this this particular infrastructure in place? Uh, so Actually, that, Mr. You know, Mr. Chair, getting the land for that was, I happen to know this because I got all of it except for the last piece and I was in negotiations when I left on the last piece and it was not, it was not easy to get um, that 
that, you know, we have buildings. So we had to get land from Vogue Optical, their front yard. Um, we had to get land from, um, what is it, uh, uh, the discounters there, their front yard. Um, it, it wasn't, it, it, the, it was a land availability issue, um, period. It wasn't that we didn't try to get more land because we would have liked to have had more land for a whole lot of reasons. Um, including and and maybe and I'm not going to say that it was because of bike lanes, but for a whole lot of safety for a whole lot of reasons. So we all we could get was land enough to build a safe roundabout that would accommodate the traffic on that uh, the amount of traffic in that area. You know, there's there's just been so much emphasis in recent years, Donna. Uh, people looking to uh, yep. you know yep. bike to work for recreational purposes, yep. whether it's active or passive. Uh, you know, uh, making, uh, you know, making it safer, uh, you know, Towers Road is a discussion we're going to have here uh, in terms of the path. We're going to have those discussions as well. Um, it, very unfortunate, very unfortunate. So, like, Mr. Mayor, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, again, I, I think if, if, if any of you can get to the mayor's task force and active transportation meetings, they're getting away from bike lanes. They're now referring to them as active transportation pathways, which allows them to be shared with walkers, cyclists, uh, mothers and fathers with baby carriages, uh, rollerbladers and so forth. So I think the engineers working on this project may look at re, re, repurposing or reconfiguring um, how we look at these crosswalks, pedestrian walks and make them more uh, multi-use as active transportation pathways uh, are, are plan. That's the plan of them. Uh, just coming back from Toronto, bike lanes are just for bikes. I, I, we're trying to make these more uh, multi-use so that you have walkers and, and riders respecting each other for the use of that pathway. T case in point, Victoria Park, that inside lane, laneway started as a bike, a bike lane. It is now an active transportation pathway and it's used by many users. So thinking, I'm looking going forward and it was Peter Rukavina that said, like, we have to look at the shared pathways as a way forward. And that's, that's I think that's what uh, the engineers uh, that will be overseeing this project may have to incorporate in the, uh, in the new, uh, this roundabout at the corner of uh, Belvedere Avenue, St. Peter's Road and Brackley Point Road. But it, Mr. Chair, it's a good segue into uh, uh, Janice Harper's presentation about uh, the new Aqua Arena facility that we're looking at uh, replacing uh, Simmons and their proposal, and that's next on the agenda. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I did it. I did attend one of those uh, meetings. So not not all that long ago. One of their number one priorities, Mr. Mayor, was the uh, construction of the active transportation pathway on Towers Road, yeah. and uh, you know uh, that that's 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 one project that this community. Yeah has demanded to be done. They have in the last three or four years. So uh, I know I'm going to be having discussions here uh, with with the community and hopefully with council to support that project uh, yeah. because uh, obviously there's no, there's absolutely no justification whatsoever that that project's not moving forward. Yeah. So getting back to the task force, I mean, that's one of their recommendations. They've made that crystal clear yeah. as well as everyone. For that matter. So, uh, you know, 75 emails. I've come into City Hall regarding that particular project. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm being asked about it, uh, you know, every second or third day. So, uh, yeah. you know, in all these groups that are working towards a common goal, I agree that the yeah. pathway is multi-purpose, and and you know, for some reason we're we're not moving in that direction. So, uh, got a lot of work, a lot of work to do there, a lot of work to do. So, let's move on to uh, Janice Harper, and and before we. Get into that. I know Ramon, uh, Janice did contact our department, or I think it would have been the Act of Transportation. Uh, they did send us correspondence uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. We received the information. I included our manager, and our manager said this is a, a prerequisite or responsibility of Parks and Recreation. And I think, Ramon, please correct me if I'm wrong, you did forward uh, that correspondence and those recommendations on to the appropriate. A department, which is parks and recreation. So, yeah. Ramona, it was a clarification. 
Yeah, exactly. So we made some changes, as you may remember, to our um, terms of reference for the Mayor's Act of Transportation Committee. What we were finding before is every single motion and recommendation was having to come to the ENS committee, and then the, we were referring it then to each of the um, committees. What And then I was the key point, like the staff member that was attending those meetings every month. But as we know, with active transportation, it spans police, it spans yep. parks and rec, it spans yep. public works, and we have our own role to play too. So what we did was we changed it so that um, the active transportation task force would meet with um, one of the managers of each of those four departments um, on a bi-monthly basis so that they would have an opportunity to speak directly to that manager about concerns they had or ideas they had related to that. And we also changed the terms of reference that those committee reports, those recommendations coming from the task force don't have to go through ENS first. They can go directly to that no. um, department with that they're relevant. So with that, uh, uh, that project, because it's related to Simmons, um, of course, like on the staff level, I'm like an advocate for cycling and want to see those things happening. But, you know, the conversations we've had in this committee is that it's outside of our own committee terms of reference to be getting into some of these things that are related to other departments and that those committee, um, that those recommendations should go directly to the relevant department. So, the files from Janice went to, um, through Doug DeMay, went to the um, manager of Parks and Recreation. He did stop by the other day. He noted that he's looked through them. They're having some discussions, but also we want to have some of those discussions about feasibility at the staff level before bringing something to council so that we can bring forward a, a sound recommendation. So that is currently happening as far as I'm aware. Um, and so I think it would not be in line with the process that we've set up on this to have Janice come in and present to our committee as much as it's of interest. It's not within our scope to be um, entertaining those presentations and making them recommendations on it. Yeah. That's my take on it process wise. Um, yeah. Understood. Mr. Chair, again, Janice Harper, who did work with the city, Donna remembers when she did work with planning, very enthusiastic about how we take a look at this uh, Simmons Commons and how we can connect North River Road with Spring Park Road with the five, six schools in the area. I thought it was an opportunity, and this is the discussion we had on April 19th at the Mayor's Task Force on Active Transportation uh, meeting, where I thought it was a, a, a good idea to present it to all committees parks and recreation, public works, because that way we can get a, an understanding of where she wants to go. And not only that, we can tweak it to make it a very workable, practical solution so that we can provide that interconnectivity of walkers, cyclists, uh, skateboarders, rollerbladers, uh, wheelchair uh, users within this within this whole complex that we're, we'll be spending probably somewhere in the area of $30 million. So I think she was anxious, excited to make a pitch to as many groups as possible because she did an excellent job uh, presenting to the active, uh, the mayor's task force and active transportation meeting on April 19th. So I thought, uh, again, this was a good news story. And I thought this was one conduit to start, start it with, uh, with start, start the process of getting us on side and Let's make sure it's part of the planning process uh, for this new uh, Aqua Arena complex that we hopefully will be opening in the next year or year and a half. Thank maybe, you, Chair. Maybe that would be a, uh, something she could present at, to the staff. Donna could maybe organize that where the managers can hear the same plan and message that, you know, mm -hmm. what it could look like. And eventually it could come to all of council. But I agree that we should follow, make sure we're following the process for sure. Yeah. It's just a good news story and a very uh, Janice Harper and the group that she works with, the Brighton group, are very uh, uh, motivated by, of, of making this a, a very inclusive, uh, diverse complex, not just for swimming and, and, and ice sports, but for active transportation. Yeah. And Mr. Chair, just a, just a note, we do have one more report in our in and we want to move into closed session with the time we have. So just a, a note that we should probably get to that. 
I only have thank a couple more minutes, so yes, thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Um, okay, uh, we'll now move to item seven. Motion to move into closed session as per section 1191A of the Municipal Government Act. Do I have a mover? Do I have a mover? Moved. 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 Brown. All right. Uh, we're now in a closed closed session.